Welcome to the Game Day Playbook presented by Fan Food, a discussion around how leaders are transforming the sports and live entertainment industry by leveraging technology to enhance the fan experience and operate game day more efficiently. I'm your host, Rob Cressy. And joining me today is Steve Beaton, Executive Director at National Booster Club Training Council. Steve, super excited to have you on the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Rob. Looking forward to talking with you. So can you give a quick overview on who you are and what you do? Yeah, so I'm the executive director of the National Booster Club Training Council. We're actually the governing body of the Booster Club Association. So we, our, our main focus is guidance, education, training, and support to a group of about 600 and some odd thousand booster clubs. Um, they range anything from your K-12 up to your non-school-based groups, both sports, music, and arts. But our focus is primarily on education and training. So most of the workshops that happen around the country, if they're done with the state interscholastic athletic associations or some of the national associations, they're either partnered with us using our content or we're the ones that are out there doing the training and education. So if we're, look, if we're looking at booster clubs, what does someone need to do to get better and improve or optimize what they're doing? Yeah, the, probably the biggest thing is, is, and this is an area that I can say 20 plus years ago, um, compliance and best practices wasn't something that, that groups really looked at. They just, it was a good old boy club, I'll call it. And unfortunately, history has shown us that there's a lot of challenges out there. You've got some very passionate parents that get involved in helping support their kids in a given extracurricular program. And unfortunately, you know, they're pushed into or step into a program with no background, no training, no formal oversight. And so they start doing what the groups before have done. And unfortunately, what happens is a lot of these groups they fail to become compliant and even conduct activities and best practice. And when I say compliant, it could be at the state level or the federal level. So it's not un uncommon to see booster clubs that unfortunately, maybe they were tax exempt 501 C3 five, six, 10 years ago, but for whatever reason, they didn't know they had to file annual renewals or 990s. So compliance and best practices across the board is probably the number one area of focus that boosters really should focus in on if they wanna become successful and really thrive to help their programs. All right, so let's get to the booster clubs who are already established. And let's say they're already doing that and they're like, Steve, you know what? We want to elevate our game even more. What's the next thing for this that can help them become even more efficient or more optimized? Yeah, so it's always booster clubs do two things. They provide volunteer support and they raise funds. And unfortunately, it doesn't matter if it's a school-based program or if it's a non-school-based program like a Pop Warner group. You know, they're all having to raise more dollars. So it's it's really based around how do we then raise the most amount of dollars for our program with the least amount of work. And I know that concessions for a large number of them, in fact, years ago, we, we partnered with Sam's Club because they really wanted to help to educate the marketplace more and how can we really do some things. So now we've got some great program partners like Fan Food and them. And so so concessions are the big area. It's a it's a game winner for them if they can do it right, do it efficiently, make sure they've got the good volunteers in there, good security practices. But but fundraising is number one for groups. What what makes running concessions right? Like what it, when you say, hey, running concessions right, what, is, what does that mean? Can you give us sort of a framework? Yeah, well, it's, you know, you've got some groups that will just go down to the local convenience store and they'll pick up product and they're really not buying those products at the best prices. You've got other groups that they don't take the focus on how do we brand and market what we're trying to do? How do we get the word out? You know, we maybe we put a, an open door of a concession stand and we hope people come but there's no marketing and branding to it. So it's really, a, it's a nucleus of buying your products at a good efficient price point, getting the marketing, the branding out to the, to the customers that you're going to support, and then be able to efficiently and effectively provide them with whether it's popcorn or hot dogs or soft drinks. And what you'll find is a lot of people are turned off because they'll go to that little concession stand at the game and they see a line of 30 people. And that unfortunately, it keeps a lot of them from wanting to purchase. So getting a good marketing strategy together is really key and foremost and be able to maximize the, the revenues that are generated at concession stands. So what do you do to combat the lines? Because well, again, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I keep going. I think you got what I was going to ask. Like, what do you do to combat the lines? Yeah. So, so one of the things, in fact, fan food, I want to, I want to kind of highlight these guys today because, you know, they've got some technology that allows the consumers 
to be able to go onto their, their cell phone and, and via through the app, they can literally make a purchase. And the niceness to it is, is that that product can be brought out to them in the stands. So it's no longer having to run down the stands, go to the concession, stand in line. You know, those kind of cutting edge tech technologies are what's going to help not just our concessionaires to make more dollars, but to actually service more people and to do it in a better frame. I agree completely with you on the technology side of things. But if we look at what you said in the very beginning where someone's taking over where there is an inefficient process to begin with. And now we're starting to talk about we're going to start layering on technology on top of this, which seems a little bit more advanced, albeit it's the right way to do so. So where is the intersection between these two of adoption and making sure that they can still do what they're setting out to do? It's kind of the old curse to keep it really simple. And so anytime we can have training, we can have um, technology that's going to come with some walk by step by steps. And again, fan food does a great job. We do it in our concessions, best practice workshops as well. You know, we teach and preach the fundamentals of it. it's just the, the prior proper planning is going to help position those. So the basics again, cause you're right. You've got the parent who yesterday couldn't spell booster club. Next thing you know, they're pushed into becoming the fundraising or the concessions director. They have no idea what to do. So helping them pre those events in the basics of the fundamentals of how, what kind of volunteers do we need? You know, why do you need health permits, which a lot of people don't realize they need health permits, you know, and then what kind of products and then implementing the technology and so companies like FanFood, they bring the training for those people and a very simplified step by step. That combination will help bring success for their programs. What other types of technologies are there that are being used in concessions and booster clubs? You know, unfortunately, there's really not. It's the, the concession stand is it's in, in our world. Now, now, when we go into the, the world of the professional sports and such, which is not our market, but when you talk about those school-based programs, which dominate the concessions, and, and more specifically, a lot of your high school programs, when you have booster clubs that are running those, again, what we have to understand is, is again, you know, a couple months prior to them taking on those positions and starting to launch concessions, they had no experience. And so unfortunately, there really isn't a lot of technological training within the marketplace. So companies like FanFood, these are new companies, new emerging opportunities for these groups to start to slowly techno bring technology into what they're doing. Basically, it's, it's the same old, same old they've been doing for years and decades, and that is they buy product, they throw it in there, they open the door, and they hope they can make some sales. They're positioned well, though. They're usually positioned in a good, good location where they've got good visibility. But now let's just start to expand that marketing and branding. And again, let's use stuff like fan food to really help get the word out to their, to their customers. Well, what's nice about it, too, is, is that I'll end with this, and that is boosters. You know, we're teaching and preaching them that it's really important to build your databases. Build your databases, start communicating with them regularly. So that fits hand in hand with these companies like FanFood, because now we've got a database as a booster club. We can start sending out pre-announcements and notices, letting them know, upload the app, get, get online. When you come down to concessions to buy, you no longer have to get out of your seat. You can actually literally go on the app and you can buy from us right out there in your seat in the stands. So I see two areas of communication right here. One, the communication with the person who is now in charge of the booster club or the concessions, and then their communication with their community. And, and once again, we're, we're looking at the opportunity, the, either the opportunities or the potential pitfalls. Because once again, if the communication structure was not established properly on either sides of those, that can fail and really hinder everything. So talk to me a little bit more about the communication side of all of this. Yeah, so you're, and you're exactly right because the lack of communication, lack of transition, lack of continuity, I mean, that's, that's a key component of what makes up our, our organization, our booster clubs out there. And, and it's unfortunate because what you have is when you take a high school booster club, it's not uncommon to find that it's the senior parents that are running the executive roles. Well, what happens is at the end of the year, April, May, and they'll all of a sudden have new elections. Well, that's the same time the school's getting ready to transition out. So all those old officers, they leave that program, new officers take in their leadership roles and they don't know what to do. So for decades, we have worked on helping to provide a continuity and transition process of teaching and educating these boosters that, hey, let's no longer put senior parents in executive roles. When we do that, we have an underclass parent that takes on that leadership role. They're there to transition and mentor and train those incoming officers before they leave. Same thing with concessions. You've got a concessions director. They've got to have somebody that they're working with either in a co-position 
or they're working from a standpoint of transitioning to train them. So we've got that training that continues on. We do a lot of workshops around the country. We do what we call our booster basics. And one of the components we do along with our concessions as practice workshop is that the fundamentals of how do we teach, how do we train, how do we educate those directors or those officers of the booster clubs to get the communications out and how do we do it in a, in a better, uh, more efficient, more effective manner. But it's the basics. It's really not our marketplace, unfortunately, is not real high tech yet. It's not not real sophisticated. It's just the basic passing the word on, teaching and educating face-to-face -face emails and stuff. It seems that obviously one of the challenges is the turnover of this. It's just a natural part of uh, someone's child going to college. So I'm no longer need to be in charge of the booster club. How much of this is there? Let's almost call it a written strategy. So something that if I look into my world, when I'm working with brands, I create written social media strategies for them. Reason being employee turnover happens. And the last thing that you want to do is every time someone new comes in to be part of your social media team, you don't want to have to start back at zero. Instead, you can say, hey, let's reference this document and really create something that is foundational that allows you to build a blueprint there. How important or how prevalent is, let's just call it written foundational stuff that becomes part of the Booster Club Foundation? It's huge. In fact, there's two things that we, we promote. And we have a concessions best practice directory, a guide that walks through everything from A to Z on concessions. Um, we give that out to Booster Clubs. We hand it out at our workshops. Um, you know, it's something that we, we really em enforce upon the groups because it does, it helps them to understand even just it's in the back of it. It's even got things like recipes for, you know, Frito, Frito Supremos and stuff, which groups don't think about those things. So it's really important to have that stuff to pass on. And then what we also teach is we teach these groups that when you get involved, we want each of you to put together officer books. So if it's a concessions director, that concession director needs to have a book three ring binder, you know, it's got information in there on tips and pointers and to do's. And we tell people the most valuable part of that book is in the very back where those past off or officers, concession directors in this case, they're leaving tips and pointers to future ones and they pass that on. So between those two resources, it does, it provides a lot. And it's, it's kind of amazing because we tell boosters and we've got booster clubs that have been in existence for decades and they don't have these things. And we should sit down and tell them, you know, you put this book together and literally today is the, the most least valuable time it's going to be because think about five generations out and you're now that incoming concession director and you've got that. You've got the, the past historical information and tips and guidance and pointers and resources from all these past ones. It's huge. And that truly, it's funny because I can tell you that doing workshops around the country, I have booster club officers that come up and say, you know, years ago, I remember you guys telling us about this and you're right. I mean, this stuff is valuable stuff. So those two resources are great. And those are just the starting points, but what we use for healthy boosters and concessions. Are and is that then by written, I mean, digital written. So hypothetically yeah. speaking, that now lives in a, a Google doc. So we can now be a little bit more technologically advanced instead of uh, Sandy has the written document in her house. And we have to track it down and then someone spilled on it. So has it at least... Uh, improved with the digital era to now it's a little bit more shareable yeah so the the concessions the concessions best practice guide that is that's digital that's a pdf guide that's given out it's it's given the we teach though that the the three ring binders of the officers we really want them to have them in hand and the reason why is there, there's a couple problems that boosters have and that is the lack of parent participation is number one and foremost of all groups it's real typical that you find the handful of parents doing all kinds of work nobody else gets involved because they see it as another job so what we teach them though is when they've got those guys and they're stepping out of their position that person who's maybe a little reluctant and stepping in to take on a role of that new New, new position when they know they're going to get the association provides our members with train club advisors so they've got somebody they can turn to but most importantly when they're given something in their hand they can open it up and start to read it and they can start to see there's information it does take a lot of the stress and anxiety away and you'll find parents that will step in and say okay yeah I'll take this on there is some information here so we try to have them keep that in a print format but the concessions guide is online and all the resources that are in that that officer's book they're online as well too uh, but having something you can hand to them, it is, it is huge in our marketplace. So Steve, if we're looking forward, what do we need to be paying attention to regarding booster clubs and concessions to put ourselves in a position to succeed? Like what's on your mind looking forward right now? Yeah. So the biggest thing, and unfortunately the, there is a lot of, 
um, media attention on misappropriation and fraud. And so I would say first and foremost, from an accounting standpoint, and, th and this is taking away all the other product and everything, because there's a lot of products we can put, but making sure that we have got you know, our accounting procedures and our financial procedures in place so that when we open the concessions, you know, we've had at least two people reconcile the, the, the amount of money we're starting with. At the end of it, we're doing an inventory control. We're doing the reconciliation of the funds that have been made. And the reason I share that is because all the rest of it, even if we kind of slack a little bit of it, it's not going to hurt us. It's not going to hurt a person's reputation or credibility. But when funding or when the lack of or maybe the misuse of funding comes into play, I have seen it destroy people. So that's the one area we try to teach and preach that we make sure we, we're conducting our, our concessions and our booster practices in general in a, in a good, accountable way. And if we do that, the rest of it's just a learning curve. And, and, and companies like, like FanFood, when they come on and they start using this technology, it makes it so much easier. And, and also, to kind of to that point, FanFood allows these booster clubs to be able to not have to handle the actual dollar, which then does to help some of the accountability so they can pay on their app, which it's kind of nice. So, Steve, is there anything I didn't ask you that you think would benefit the audience? Um, you know, I, booster clubs is one of those big, broad strokes. I mean, unfortunately, if you gather 100 parents up and say, what's a booster club? Uh, most of them have a misunderstanding. And so I think the biggest thing is, is if you have an opportunity and you've got kids in programs, whether it's, you know, sports, music or arts, and you hear a booster club meeting, I would encourage you to go out and attend the meeting because these booster clubs have the opportunity not only to truly raise a lot of dollars for programs that are in desperate need, but they can actually change the life of kids out there. And I, I say that because my personal experience goes back almost three decades ago, but I was one of those dads. I was a booster club president, and I remember I had a, a basketball coach that came to my house, and she's sharing almost in tears that she's losing a senior player because her dad had lost his job and wasn't going to be able to send her to camp. Well, the moral of my story in that 20 month period of time as a booster president, we as a booster club were able to help about 13 kids continue on in sports and music and arts programs when they thought they had to quit. And the niceness of that is those 13 kids, nine of those kids got college scholarships. So I tell people about booster clubs, we didn't get the scholarship, but we made it possible. So these kids could continue on in programs they keep them in school, out of gangs, off drugs, GPAs out, pregnancies down. They give them life skills. And so I just encourage parents, get out, support your booster clubs, get involved. Um, we're here to help provide the guidance and the education, the training, the support. And as a nucleus group, they can do some tremendous things. And it doesn't really matter if it's low income, inner city, title one, or some of the bigger markets. It's the same across the board. That's awesome, Steve. Where can people connect with you in the National Booster Club Training Council? Yeah, we're, our, our website's boosterclubs.org. Um, you know, you can visit the website. There's some resources on there, even if they're not member clubs, you're just somebody interested. In fact, we get a lot of groups that come to us in what we call pre-organization. Let's some parents that got together or the coach or an administrator at the school said, hey, we need a booster club. We need to either build the morale or the spirit or we need to raise some dollars. Um, you know, they can come. Uh, we don't turn boosters clubs away, even though we are a member based association. Um, every year, I think we're given about 6,000 scholarships to low income inner city programs. So, yeah, have them come to boosterclubs.org. Um, we can help them out. Or if nothing else, if they've just got questions and they're maybe considering, um, they can talk to one of the club advisors and then give them some good guidance. And as always, I would love to hear from you about this episode. You can hit up FanFood on Twitter at FanFoodOnDemand, on Instagram at FanFoodApp or on LinkedIn. And you can hit me up on LinkedIn by searching Rob Cressy. It's going, going, it's in there. A new Major League record. New Major League record. New Major League record.